When we think of the word value, it's uh, sometimes the most, the first thing that comes to our mind is how much? Is it on sale? Well, today we'll be using the word value in a different light. The definition we'll use for value this morning is, or rather this afternoon, is moral or ethical principles that we view as good and important. So moral and ethical principles that we view as important. Now, when it comes to values, it could differ from person to person. My values, personal values, what I think is important to me, may be different than someone else's because of their experience, their background, education, whatever the case may be. So we'll be talking uh, primarily about the values as outlined in Jehovah's Word, the Bible. So moral or ethical principles that we view as important. Now it's important for us to determine uh, what our goals and priorities are because what we value, what our values are, reflect what our goals and priorities are. For example, uh, many place a high value on the accumulation of wealth, right? Getting the money, so to speak. Thus, they may set only materialistic goals, such as getting a well-paying job or investing strategically. So for those individuals whose value is what they consider money, that's what, what's important to them, they don't care about uh, spending three to six years to get a bachelor's degree, paying between ten to $35,000 a year to get that because in the end, they're going to get the money. Right? For them, it doesn't matter what time and energy they spend, uh, you know, what stock prices they buy or invest in gold. Right? So that's what they pursue. That's what's important to them. Some people place a high value on fame and prominence, fame and prominence. And so they may seek to attain recognition through higher education or the cultivation of unique talents or skills. Have you ever met someone, I know this is true where I work in academia, where if you introduce yourself, the next thing they'll say, oh, I'm so-and-so, MD, XD, whatever name or title they are, right? Oh, I'm CEO, whatever, because they, their worth, their value is on their fame, their prominence, right? Now, on that note, uh, some, some of them probably wouldn't even care or think twice about spending $300,000 $300, to get the letters MD after their name. It doesn't matter because it's the fame. They want that prominence. They want to be higher than some people. Now, uh, there was a study that was uh, surveyed, and it was showed that some families can spend upwards of $1,000 a month for a child to compete, whether that's sports, dance, or things of that nature, because they want to nurture their, their children to attain fame and prominence in the world of sports. Right? That's, that, that's their value. The world also plays a high value on the pursuit of recreation recreation and entertainment. It is such a big thing. Did we know that the entertainment industry, or, or rather the travel industry alone, it, the revenue is $1.6 trillion a year, right? If we ever go on a cruise, what's gonna happen during the cruise? They're gonna give you offers to go on the next cruise, right? Oh, it's the best deal ever. It's for next fall or next spring, just book it now, right? And so a lot of people pursue recreation, entertainment. That's their value. They live for the weekends, right? They need a vacation after their vacation. That's the life that they live. Well, what is generally the result of those who value such things? Well, those who avidly pursue wealth develop an appetite that is never satisfied, right? Have you ever heard them say, there's not enough gold in the world? Imagine that if you have all the gold in the world, right? There's never enough money in the world. That's because for them, it's a never-ending cycle. The more you get, there's more, there's never enough. So it's a, a you know, pursuit, lifestyle of pursuing wealth. Those who chase after fame and prominence often do not see how uh, quickly it fades, right? 
fame and prominence. That's all they search for. Uh, we just finished the basketball season, right? So no doubt most those who watch it, I kind of don't sometimes, um, know who the MVP was. So who was the MVP last year? Five years ago. Ten years ago. Right? So fame and prominence, although we get a lot of attention, it quickly fades away. How about those who live for recreation? Well, we mentioned that already. Those who live for recreation fail to realize just how temporary it is. It's so fleeting. Once you're finished with it, you want more of it because it's gone. Most of the time, we don't even get the chance to rest and relax after a vacation because it's always on our mind. Right? Now, God's Word, the Bible, highlights the ultimate result of pursuing goals based on worthless things. If we pursue valueless <laughs> things or worthless values, the Bible tells us what the end result is. Turn your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 John. First John chapter 2. Let's look at verse 15. Here it reads, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love either the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? Because everything in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desire of the eyes, the showy display of one's means of life, right? We talked about wealth, fame, and prominence, does not originate with the Father, but originates with the world. So all of these things are worldly. But look at the bottom line, verse 17. Furthermore, the world is passing away, and so is its desire. So we can see how if we set our goals, our priorities, on things that are really not of real value, right? Then it is worthless according to the scripture. But look at the positive note. At the latter end of verse 17, it says, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. The one who does the will of God remains forever. So we are going to compare today the difference between pursuing things that are of less worth, right? the world's values, as opposed to Jehovah's values, things that he cherished, things that are worthwhile for us to pursue because our Jehovah wants us to pursue them and with the end result of living forever. And we'll discuss that in greater detail later. So today, this afternoon, we'll be talking about three main uh, areas where we can have a true value in our, li in our life. The first one is seeking God's kingdom first, We'll be talking about acquiring a good name with Jehovah. We'll be talking about how we can have a spirit of love and unity. So those are the three main areas we'll talk about. But first, let's talk about the excellence of Jehovah's values. Since everything is valueless without life, right? Everything is valueless without life. The highest values are those associated with maintaining a good relationship with the giver of life. So what does that mean for us? Well, for example, let's illustrate. The giver of life, right, the, whose preeminent quality is love, right, the giver of life, gave us the senses. Give us our senses so that we can enjoy life. That's uh, uh, sight, smell, taste, and touch. So let's imagine bread, right? Freshly baked bread. Unless we're, you know, gluten intolerant, it might not be good. But there's substitutes for that, that's okay. But imagine freshly baked bread, right? From a distance, you can smell it, right? If it's so good, you know, your mouth starts to, you know, salivate a little bit, open up the oven, steam comes out, you pop it on the counter, you know, and then you sort, sort of kind of touch the top, you know, it's soft and hot, but mmm, so nice. Cut it open, steam comes out, the color, the crust on the outside, the moist, uh, doughy goodness on the inside. You can smell it, right? You can taste it, you can touch it. It looks good, then you take your bite. Mmm! Freshly baked bread. 
Now, imagine trying to enjoy that same piece of bread or having that same piece of bread without our senses, without sight, taste, smell. How will that be for you? What the, what's the experience going to be? As Anaya often say, it'll be boring. Right? So life, or the capacity to enjoy life, really, is, is reliant on having a relationship with our Creator. Because if we do not have that relationship with Jehovah, our Creator, then whatever we pursue, even that loaf of bread, will be meaningless. There's, this is a wonderful a quote from the Watchtower 2001, and I'll just read it briefly. Watchtower 2001, it describes it this way. Though it is not possible to live forever without Jehovah, Try to imagine what an extremely long life would be like without our Creator. It would be empty without purpose. And isn't that the case? Even though we don't have eternal life right now, many who do not find purpose in their life because they're alienated from Jehovah, do not have that relationship with Jehovah, their life is meaningless. They have no hope. And so that is why it's important for us to realize that when we set goals for our lives, when we make decisions, when we set priorities, we always consider what Jehovah's thoughts are in the matter, what values he has, and what values he considers are important for us to imitate. And those are the three areas that we'll talk about that we mentioned earlier. So let's get right into that. Jehovah, through his written word, emphasizes spiritual goals as values. Now, whereas the world promotes accumulating riches, the Bible teaches us to be liberal and ready to share. So we're talking about the first one. Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 33. So let's turn there. Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. Remember our first uh, value, scriptural value, seeking God's kingdom. Matthew 6, 33. Now, uh, just a view, a way of a context here. Jesus was teaching. He's uh, doing a sermon on the mount, right? And he just finished talking about anxieties in life, right? Don't worry about those things that you care about. You know, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? All of those, he said, are meaningless. They're valueless. What's important, he said, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, here he said, keep on then seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all those other things will be added to you. So this is one of uh, Jehovah's uh, principal values that he wants us to cultivate, seeking God's kingdom first. Yes, we have cares. Yes, we have worries. But it's important for us to seek God's kingdom first, not material things. So when we set goals, when we set goals, priorities in our lives, we, get, we spend our time, energy, and resources in the pursuit of kingdom interest first. What does that mean on a practical level? Well, on the basis of employment, right? All of us need the job. All of us need to get a job so we can eat, right? Cover our basic material needs. And that's alluded to in Matthew chapter 6. But... When it comes to employment, what am I working for? Right? Do I want to get that title of manager, senior VP, associate director, whatever, right? So we can get more money? Don't worry, I'll contribute it to Jehovah later. Right? So what, what's the purpose of our job? Is it a means to an end to support ourselves? Or are we trying to climb the corporate ladder because we want to get that, accumulate that wealth for ourselves. What's my viewpoint when work interferes with my ministry or meeting attendance? We'll talk about that later in our watch hour about persecution, right? But what is my viewpoint if I have to miss the meetings, right, because of work? If, I, if work interferes with my ministry on a regular basis, right? We're not talking about once in a while, it does happen. But on a regular basis, we're me missing our meetings, or we can't go into ministry because of our work schedule. Well, 
Are we seeking God's kingdom first? Are we putting goals, pursuit of uh, material things, wealth, prominence, security, in front of seeking God's uh, kingdom first? The same goes with education. What type of education am I seeking? We've had many articles about this, right? Are we seeking education to get by so we can support ourselves or so that we can get those letters behind our name so we can make more money? Because after all, if I'm going to pioneer, I, you know, I'm high maintenance. I need my car, I need that IKEA couch, you know, I need to make all this money. So what is the purpose of seeking education? Right? What are my goals after education? We lived in Berkeley, rather we were in the congregation in Berkeley, and we would have all these college uh, kids that would come, you know, and they'd go attend the meetings. They have, you know, they have fine spiritual goals, right? One wanted to be an architect so he can serve in Bethel. Well, because of higher education and the association they're in, after he graduated, right, barely attends any meetings anymore. Right? So again, when we're talking about goals, education, our employment, are we doing it simply for us? With the end result of accumulating wealth, or are we doing it to pursue kingdom interest first? And that's what it means when we're talking about seeking God's kingdom. How about recreation and entertainment? We mentioned that earlier, do I live for the weekends. When I look at my phone, or my calendar, if we still do that, is my calendar full of social activities? Oh yeah, no, I gotta go to this gathering over here. Oh well, yeah, this, this gathering is here, or oh, that's for this Friday. It's so full, jam-packed with social activities. Someone asks us, hey, can you go to the Minion? Can you go out and service with me? Thursday, I have a return visit. Oh no, you know, my schedule's packed. I'm booked. What are we spending our time with? Do, I, do we live for recreation, for entertainment? Do I ensure that the time I spend with recreation and entertainment is balanced with spiritual activities? Now this is interesting because balance doesn't necessarily mean 50-50, right? So when we spend eight hours in the ministry, that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, okay, I can watch TV for eight hours. Right? That's not how it goes proper spiritual balance. That's what we're talking about. Balancing what's more important in our lives. If the amount of time we spend in the ministry or preparing for the meetings is the same amount of time we pursue recreation, is that really spiritual balance? Is that really putting God's kingdom first? Seeking God's kingdom first? Well, obviously not. So, do I cherish the Bible's value by setting goals so to give of my time, energies, and valuable things, seeking God's kingdom first? True scriptural value, something that we can have forever. The second area, although most humans known by men are soon forgotten, those known by God are remembered with eternal life in view. With eternal life in view. So here we're talking about acquiring a good name with Jehovah. Now, the book of Malachi, prophet Malachi, uh, was uh, given, Je Jehovah gave him that direction to, for the nation of Israel, because at that time it was just a bad condition. A lot of them were offering, you know, lame sacrifices to Jehovah. You know, they were divorcing their wives to marry false worshipers. So the situation in uh, the Israelites was really deplorable. It was really low. So when Malachi came, Jehovah gave him a message, not only to warn them to turn around, but also he gave them an opportunity to find out, to know that, or rather a guarantee that if you do turn around, this is what I have for you. Let's take a look at that. Malachi chapter 3 verse 16. Let's see what Jehovah promised them if they were to turn away from all these worthless things. Malachi. Malachi. Your minor prophet, right? I'm so used to tap tapping now. <laughs> there we go. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. 
So after he promised them, you know, if you turn around, this will be the blessing. Verse 16, at that time, those who feared Jehovah spoke with one another, each one with his companion, and Jehovah kept paying attention and listening. So Jehovah drew his attention towards his people. And the latter part, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those fearing Jehovah and for those meditating in his name. So those who acquire a good name with Jehovah, what happens? Their name is written in that book of remembrance. So how can we do that? How can we acquire a good name with Jehovah? Well, 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, that one who does the will of God remains forever. So doing God's will, acquiring a good name with Jehovah, entails us to be obedient, to follow the direction that Jehovah wants us to follow. So for example, when it comes to directions from the faithful slave, do we follow their directions? I mean, very recently we have, uh, we have, we just had an accumulation of uh, instructions from the faithful slave, right? Placing literatures used to be the highlight, right? Saturday, place of wash, shine away. The direction has changed, right? Share a scripture, show a video, or just talk. Have a spiritual conversation, even if you don't get a chance to share a scripture or show a video. Have, you know, develop that friendship, that relationship. Talk to them. That's a switch. Right? That's theocratic direction from the faithful slave. How are we, when it comes to that, are we following that direction? Or are we still bent on doing what we've always done in the past? How about when we get reminders um, from the letters from the branch? How about this? We get reminders also from different publications and videos, right? Our convention reminders, we get that like once a year, you know that video, right? You know, don't save seats. You know, if you sit in the elderly and uh, disabled area, only one or two, you know, not wear perfume, not, not go outside and get food. Are we following the direction? See, again, acquiring a good name with Jehovah means we follow direction. Are we following scriptural direction? How about the body of elders when they give us direction? Are we apt to follow their direction? Right? And lately we've, been, we've had a lot. Because as a congregation, as Jehovah's organization, we're so busy. We need help for LDC things. We need help with uh, disaster preparation. Right? Cleaning the kingdom hall. A lot of these things are just, you know, mostly on a local level. But what are we doing? Do we just hear these directions, these instructions to follow direction one ear and out the other? Oh, you know, I can't do it because this, this, and this. And that. Now, it may be justifiable that we have reasons because we do have this, this, and that. But do we even consider what we can do to follow these directions? No matter how little a contribution we may make. It may not be monetary. Could be something physical that we can give. Could be an encourage, you know, encouraging thought, right? But keeping in mind that following direction from the faithful and discreet slave from the body of elders is something that will help us acquire a good name with Jehovah. And if we acquire a good name with Jehovah, a book of remembrance, our names could be written there. So, do I cherish the Bible's values by aiming to make decisions in my life that will help me? acquire a good name with Jehovah. Let's consider a third one, our last one. A spirit of love and unity. While the gratification that comes from recreation is temporary, right? we talked about it, it's temporary. We can pursue it as much as we want, and when we remember the uh, Solomon talked about with the making of books, there's no end. It's not just books that's vying for our enter, enter, by way of entertainment and recreation. It's not just books anymore. Solomon was wise, but we got audio books. We got films that are in books. We have movies, right? There's series. I mean, there's just so much out there to take our time away from Jehovah. Right? And it's tiring. We've heard of that term binge watching. Yeah, I've been guilty of that. Right? 
But see, if we keep pursuing these things, well then, we forget the other important things that we need to do. Colossians chapter 3, 12 to 14. Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14. We're talking about godly values, right? Galatians chapter 3, verse 12, beginning, says, Accordingly, as God's chosen ones, holy in love, clothe yourselves with the tender affections of compassion, kindness, humility, <laughs> mildness, and patience. Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely, even if anyone has a cause for complaint against another. Just as Jehovah freely forgave you, you must also do the same. But besides all these things, clothe yourselves with love. All right? That's what we're talking about, spirit of love, for it is a perfect bond of union. So having a spirit of love and unity is the, uh, is the third uh, value that we'll be focusing on. So how are we when it comes to that? Do we display a spirit of love and unity? When we're at work, you know, I have this coworker, boy, he just, man, he just, he likes to always pretend like he's working, but he's really not. You know, he's always um, smooching to the boss. You know, and he always gets preferential treatment. Oh, I just hate working with that person. And we start talking bad about that person, about our other coworkers. How are we displaying a spirit of love and unity in the workplace? Or perhaps at school, we may have a teacher that is just the, oh, the most awful teacher in the world. Oh, I don't have to sit there. Oh, I just learned nothing, right? Can we apply this principle of love and unity? It's not a rhetorical question. We really should. Because these are scriptural principles, scriptural values that Jehovah wants us to have, to have this love and unity. We need to be compassionate, we need to be patient, freely forgiving, right? Well, how about the family? Do we show love and unity in the family? I recently got a, a multifocal lenses, and I learned one thing about multifocal lenses. Well, one, I'm getting old, but that's beside the point. The other one is, now I can see far, and I can see near. And when it comes to our family members, isn't that the truth? Because we spend so much time with them, we see them when they're near, and when, even when they're far away, they're kind of like there with us still. So having that close proximity, sometimes they can rub us the wrong way. They may say things or do things that might irritate us. And trust me, we do the same. I know I do. But do we still show the spirit of love and unity in the family? To the point where, yes, we have disagreements. Yes, there's some hardships involved in the family unit. But do we still try to forgive one another? Do we still show compassion to one another? Do we show humility by saying, I'm sorry, and really mean it? Right? So things of this nature, when it comes to our family, do we practice these things? Again, in the congregation, right? This is our family outside of our immediate family. For some of us, this is our family. Well, again, the same principles. Sometimes we can get rubbed the wrong way. Do we still develop these qualities of love and unity in the Christian congregation? Something to keep in mind, that no matter what happens, no matter, as mentioned here, even if they have a cause for complaint, or even if we have a cause for complaint, even if we're justified or they're justified, we still need to do what? Verse 14, clothe ourselves with love, for it is a perfect bond of union. So do I cherish the Bible's values by putting up with a spirit of love and unity in the congregation, in the family, at work, and at school? Now earlier, friends, we defined the word value as moral or ethical principles that we view as good and important. Things that we view as good and important. 
We talked about how physical values focus on short-sighted goals that offer very little. We talked about wealth, pursuit of wealth, fame, prominence, right, and excessive recreation. We also talked about how if we do not have a good relationship with Jehovah, whatever values we may have, no matter how much we cherish these things, they're, they're really worth, worthless, right? Because we need to have that relationship with Jehovah. And since our goals depend on what we value the most, embracing the Bible's values is what will truly bring everlasting, reward, everlasting rewards. If we continue to treasure the Bible's values, we are assured of a happy, secure future. Let's conclude by reading the book of Psalm. The book of Psalm 16, 11. On a positive note, it says here, Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life, number one. In your presence is abundant joy, number two. There is happiness at your right hand forever, number three. So in three words, what can we summarize if we pursue God's values? We will have life. We will have joy forever. That's what the scripture is telling us. Eternal life in joy if we pursue <coughs> Jehovah's values. Yes, friends, seek God's kingdom first, acquire a good name with our Heavenly Father Jehovah, and live with a spirit of love and unity. And by doing so, we will live, just as Psalm mentioned, mm -hmm. forever, life, and joy. Thank you very much, Brother San Luis, for showing us whose values that we should be cherishing at Jehovah's. Thank you once again. Well, next Sunday, we're going to be having a day off from our circuit assembly, which is next Saturday, so we won't have our meeting next Sunday, but uh, we will have a meeting for service here at 10 a.m. next Sunday morning. And in two weeks, we look forward to hearing from Brother Scott Cranston, who is from the Rodeo Congregation, and his talk will be, Have Faith in the Good News. So at this time, we'd like to invite our conductor for the Watchtower forward, and that's Brother O'Doy. <coughs> Endurance. At Matthew 24, 13, we are encouraged by Jesus Christ to endure. He said, the one who has endured to the end will be saved. So we're very much interested in doing just that. So we'd like to invite you to stand if you're able to uh, do so. Uh, let's join our voices as we sing together song number 129. We will keep enduring. <coughs> and let's sing with the faith. That's song number 129. <coughs>
scripture is found there at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 which says in part that all those desiring to live with godly devotion in association with Christ Jesus will also be persecuted so we'd like to get started we have a number of uh, uh, pictures and cited uh, scriptures which we might not read please feel free to comment on those for us so that we can have a wonderful study. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are the first person to uh, to uh, raise your hand when the question is asked, uh, we encourage you to answer the question first, and then others can contribute with uh, uh, other comments or scriptures or so forth, and that would be wonderful indeed. So we've invited uh, Brother Jim Merrick, who's gonna be reading for us uh, uh, this afternoon. Let's start with paragraph one, please. On the night before our Lord Jesus was put to death, he said that all who choose to be his disciples will be hated. Up until now, faithful Christian witnesses of Jehovah have been persecuted by those who oppose true worship. As the end of this system of things draws closer, we expect our enemies to oppose us even more. Question one says, why do we need to prepare for persecution? Why? Uh, Desiree, Pushin. At the end of this system of things draws closer, we expect our enemies to oppose us even more. Okay, very good, thank you. And Sister Prochet? And Jesus foretold this at um, John 17, 14, that um, those we would be um, hated because of his name and so since we choose not to um, say have the same attitudes or conduct that um, the world has, we're no part of the world, so we're neutral in social, political context like Jesus was. Yes, okay, very good. Let's move on to paragraphs two to three. Let's look at what we should recognize about fear. How can we prepare ourselves now to face persecution? 
we do not need to imagine all the things that could happen to us. If we did, we could be overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. We could allow imagined threats to defeat us even before any real test comes. Fear is a powerful weapon that our adversary, the devil, tries to use against us. What can we do now to strengthen ourselves? In this article, we will consider how we can strengthen our bond with Jehovah and why it is vital that we do that now. We will also discuss what we can do to build up our courage. And finally, we will examine how we can cope with the hatred from opposers. So question two through three, what should we recognize about fear? Uh, Jamal Cunningham Jr. We should recognize that fear is a powerful weapon that Satan the devil tries to use to separate us from the truth. Okay, very good, all right. And uh, let's see, uh, Sister Goodman, okay. So then if we were to imagine all the things that could happen to us during a time of persecution, we could easily be overwhelmed by fear and anxiety created by our own thoughts. Yes, indeed, thank you very much. Uh, Brother Cunningham. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's brought out in Proverbs 17, 22. The crushed spirit saps one's strength. So when we dwell on things, um, it can take the energy out of us. I remember being young and um, waiting for punishment from my father. You know, <coughs> didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know what he was going to say, but the mere thought of it, I was full of anxiety. Couldn't do nothing else. Here goes some cake. I don't want it because I'm thinking about this punishment. So if we focus on things that have not taken place yet, before they even happen, we're almost doomed or dead. As good as you are, I cannot imagine the parents ever punishing you as a child. Well, what will we consider in this article? Uh, let's see, uh, Brother Jaden Smith, please. Just give us one at a time. In this article, we will consider how we can strengthen our bond with Jehovah and why it is vital that we do now, that we, that we do so now. Thank you, Jada. And Brother, uh, let's see, Josiah. We will also discuss what we can do to build up our courage. Very good, thank you. And Trifemia. Lastly, we will discuss how we can cope with hatred from opposers. Yes, thank you very much, Stratton. So, so we can see how important this lesson is for each one of us. So let's look at our first subheading: how to strengthen our bond with Jehovah. We'll start with paragraph four, please. And we'll read the, uh, the uh, assigned scripture after the paragraph. Be convinced that Jehovah loves you and that he will never abandon you. Many years ago, the Watchtower observed, the person who knows God best will trust him the most in his, the time of test. How true, to face persecution successfully, we must love Jehovah and trust in him completely, never doubting that he has affection for us. And now let's take a look at Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, Brother Mary, please. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. <clears throat> Let your way of life be free of the love of money while you are con content with the present thing. For he has said, I will never leave you and I will never abandon you so that we may be of good courage and say, Jehovah is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Thank you very much for the man. We appreciate that, that, that I'm reading there. So then... Uh, Question four, according to Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, of what must we be convinced and why? Uh, let's start with Sister uh, Wiry, please. Well, <coughs> we should be, <coughs> excuse me, convinced that Jehovah loves us and that he will never abandon us. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, Sister Cox, please. <coughs> And this is really true because as was stated earlier, some things are out of our control, control out of our hands. So when we focus on that, it does um, cause us to be um, sacrifice for our energy. So Jehovah says he won't abandon us when we 
really to believe that and think of things like how he, that he's gotten us through so far and we can truly believe that he won't leave us. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, Sister Mary Lalena? Mm -hmm. And that's what that scripture there at Hebrews helps us to realize if we can have in our mind always repeating, Jehovah is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can man do to me? So having that strong relationship with Jehovah then we really know that nothing can get to us. Yes, thank you very much, Sister Mary. Now, uh, in that same scripture, verse 5, what has the Bible said about Jehovah that should help us to arrive at that conclusion in verse 6? What does it say? Ivan? Feel his love and affection express in the things he says and does. Okay, all right. And Sister Cruz, please. <coughs> Jehovah said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. And knowing that Jehovah t cannot lie, we have to trust that Jehovah means what he says. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Sister Huey, please. That's a wonderful scripture for all of us because we can be uh, driving somewhere and stopped and having to make a defense of our faith. So that could happen any place. So we have to have that strong relationship with Jehovah. Yes, very much. Well, friends, uh, um, let's move on to um, mm -hmm. paragraph five. Uh, the bond is love for Jehovah. So what would help you to feel Jehovah's love? Paragraph five, please. Read the Bible daily with the goal of drawing closer to Jehovah. As you read, focus on Jehovah's tender qualities. Feel his love and affection as expressed in the things he says and does. Some may struggle to believe that God loves them because they have never been shown love. If you face that challenge, try making a list each day of the ways that Jehovah has shown mercy and kindness to you. As you consider your own experiences and meditate on what you have read in God's word, you will likely be able to list many things that Jehovah has done for you. The more you appreciate what Jehovah does, the stronger your bond with him will be. Yes. Uh, question five says, what will help you to feel Jehovah's love? What will help you to feel it? Uh, Sister Jo, please, Maria. By reading the Bible daily, we get to know Jehovah's qualities that he applied to people of old, but also if we meditate upon this, we can see how it applies to our own lives. Think about the times that Jehovah has demonstrated mercy, for example. Yes, indeed. And uh, let's see, uh, Caleb, see the home? Read the Bible daily with the gold of God closer to Jehovah. Thank you very much, Caleb. Uh, Brother Matt, John. So when we read the Bible regularly, we come across scriptures like Psalm 78, 38, and 39, where it tells us that Jehovah is merciful and he would forgive all of our errors, not bringing us to ruin. And it's very encouraging because he remember, remembers that we're flesh, a wind that goes past and does not return. And that's very encouraging because we're all under a lot of pressure, with, and many of us are being persecuted in one way or another. But if we remember that Jehovah loves us a lot, a lot, and he's, uh, and he's merciful, so we can always count on his help. Thank you, Brother Mary. Brother Cruz, please, up front. I appreciate Psalm 116, 1 and 2, because the psalmist says, I love Jehovah because he hears my voice, and he explains why he loves Jehovah. Each one of us have, can have different reasons to love Jehovah. You can make it personal, and when we take time to reflect on Jehovah's expressions of love for us, then we'll be motivated to make our own psalm. We love Jehovah because, and then we can express that to Jehovah in prayer as well. Thank you, Brother Cruz. Uh, Sister Newman, did you have a thought? Sister Newman, please, Brother Cruz. The world is always looking for ways to feel better despite whatever they're going through, and sometimes it's encouraged to do a gratitude journal and give credit to Mother Earth and the universe and just put it out there and it'll come back to you, whatever it is you want. And your Jehovah is teaching us that he is the source of all goodness. He is the one who is seeing us and hearing our needs, and he's going to extend mercy to us. We just have to draw close to him. So as we 
make that list and reflect on how Jehovah has helped us today, that strengthens our bond and nothing will separate us. Very good. Appreciate all those fine comments, friends. Can we personalize a psalm to ourselves? Or is that forbidden? Can we personalize it to ourselves? Does the Gladys will do it? Well, we certainly can because the Psalms were written by Jehovah's servants in the past. So as we read a particular Psalm, like Psalm 91 as an example, that we really enjoy, we can put our names in there to ourselves as we read it. And then we personalize it um, for ourselves so that Jehovah can, can hear it. Yes. Thank you, Sister Odoi. Uh, Sister Demato, please. Looking at that scripture there at Psalm 116, 1 and 2, mm -hmm. I notice that it says, uh, He hears my voice, my pleas for help. He incl inclines his ear to me. So it's very much Jehovah is focused on me. Thank you, Sister Yamato. Sister uh, Johnson, Juliana? We also see how loving the world is around us and how we might have a problem with actually accepting love, that, that we are loved by Jehovah. And in order to share that love that is shown to us, we see many scriptures that we can place ourselves in because he is so merciful. He wants us to be able to receive it and vice versa. Yes, indeed. Very good. We appreciate all those fine comments, friends. <clears throat> let's move on to paragraph 6. And let's take a look at Psalm 94, verse 17, how heartfelt prayer can help you and I. Pray regularly. Imagine a young boy in his father's loving embrace. The boy feels so secure that he openly talks to his father about both the good and the bad things that happened to him that day. You can enjoy that same type of bond if you draw close to Jehovah in heartfelt prayer each day. As you pray to Jehovah, pour out your heart like water and tell your loving Father about all your fears and anxieties. What will be the result? You will experience what the Bible calls the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The more you pray this way, the closer you will feel to Jehovah. Let's read uh, Psalm 94, 17 through 19, please, uh, Brother Mac. If Jehovah had not been my helper, I would soon have perished. When I said, my foot is slipping, your loyal love, O Jehovah, kept supporting me. When anxieties overwhelm me, you comforted and soothed me. Thank you very much, Brother Mary, for the fine reading there for us. Question six says, according to Psalm 94, 17 through 19, how can heartfelt prayer help you? Brother Jason Odoi, please. Hmm. What well, we see at Psalms 94, uh, 17 through 19, um, especially in uh, verse 18, makes mention that how uh, when I said my foot is slipping, your loyal love, O Jehovah, kept supporting me. So many times when we feel like we're um, bottled down by all the anxieties of life and stresses, we can feel that we might be losing foot, we might be, might be losing our balance, our way. But when we rely on Jehovah God and pray to Him, He then builds us up with His loyal love and uh, he's able to help us go through any trials. Thank you very much. Uh, Brother Harris in the back, please. So as we, as we read what we're talking about here, the, the one thing that, that stands out to me is that we personally have to do it. We have to pray to Jehovah. We have to pour our hearts out to him. If we do that, then we'll see the result. But if you don't do it, you won't see the result. So it, it calls on us to show that we believe what Jehovah has said and actually pray to him. Thank you, Brother Harris. We appreciate that. Sister Tisha Cunningham, please. Going along with the uh, same line with those thoughts, we know how it feels to talk to someone and then it falls on deaf ears and you don't get a response back. But the fact that we pray to Jehovah and we see his hand and we see him in action, we see him supporting and we see him helping us, then that helps us to draw closer to him. And in turn, we feel more confident and comfortable to pour our heart out and talk to him even more. And then that draws us ever closer to Jehovah and he draws even closer to us. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Sister Gunny. There was, there's an illustration in this paragraph that helps us to really put it all together. You see the illustration in paragraph? 
six. Uh, Brother Rookie, please. When we come to the Kingdom Hall, the friends may see us and give us this big bear hug. And you can just sense the love that they have for us. And here in this paragraph, it likens our prayer to a father's loving embrace. It mentions that each day we can have that hug by means of that prayer. So how much uh, love that is to be able to get, get that hug from Jehovah each day through that prayer. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for the rookie. Now, um, that's a Psalm 19, 17 through 19. Uh, any comments on verse 19 when it comes to uh, our heartfelt prayer to Jehovah? Uh, let's see. Brother Thompson, please, in the back. Here it is. All of us go through some type of anxiety on each and every day. It's no cause of our own, no fault of our own, but here it is. You never know when Jehovah will redirect something that will make you feel comfortable, will make you feel secure, and Jehovah said he would never leave you. Thank you, Brother Thompson. So that verse 19, what kind of anxieties, what is the level of anxieties that perhaps you and I face that the Bible talks about? Uh, Brother uh, Rogers, please. Here the psalmist said that his anxieties overwhelmed him. So he was at uh, rock bottom, or as we discussed uh, a couple of last two issues, stressed out. <laughs> uh, he, and at that point, he said Jehovah did comfort him, and Jehovah did soothe him. Thank you very much, Brother Rogers. And, and that's what <coughs> you and I can expect to enjoy from Jehovah when, when we embrace him. So, so now that brings us then to paragraph 7, because we must be convinced uh, that the promises of God makes his kingdom a reality for us. Paragraph 7. Be convinced that the blessings of God's kingdom will come true. If your faith in such promises is weak, it will be easier for Satan and his agents to terrify you. How can you build confidence in God's kingdom now? Make it a study project to examine God's promises about his kingdom and the reasons why you can be certain that they will come true. How will that help? Consider the example of Stanley Jones, who was imprisoned for seven years because of his faith. What helped him to endure faithfully? He said, being fortified with a knowledge of God's kingdom, being sure of it, never doubting for a moment, I couldn't be moved. If you have strong faith in God's promises, you will draw closer to Jehovah and you will not give in to fear. Thank you very much, Brother Mary. And we'd like you to comment on uh, the uh, beautiful picture we have there of uh, Brother Jones. And also, if you can, if you can comment on Proverbs 3, 25 and 26, make application for us, that would be wonderful. Question seven says, why must you be convinced <laughs> that the promises God makes about his kingdom will come true. Why must you be convinced? Uh, Sister Hilliard, please. This is Proverbs 24, 10 brings out, if we become discouraged in these distressing times, then our strength will be meager. So, we need to make sure that our our faith is strong so that we can be confident in Jehovah that he's there to help us because otherwise we could be overtaken by uh, Satan and he could make us terrified. Yes, indeed. And Sister Ruiz, please, your thoughts? When we think of the word value, it's uh, sometimes the most the first thing that comes to our mind is, how much? Is it on sale? Well, today we'll be using the word value in a different light. The definition we'll use for value this morning is, or rather this afternoon, is moral or ethical principles that we view as good and important. So moral and ethical principles that we view as important. Now, when it comes to values, it could differ from person to person. My values, personal values, what I think is...